In the early evening of the 2nd of August, 1985, a Lockheed L-1011 TriStar is on final approach to land at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Delta Airlines Flight 191 is a regularly scheduled passenger flight between Fort Lauderdale in the state of Florida and Los Angeles, California, with an intermediate stop at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport in the state of Texas. Delta Airlines 191 departed from Fort Lauderdale at 2.10pm, first heading west over the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. The flight to Dallas-Fort Worth has been largely uneventful. After passing over New Orleans in Louisiana, the aircraft has deviated north in order to avoid a developing weather front. The hot and humid weather of the southern United States in summer is fertile ground for thunderstorms. In the cockpit of Delta Airlines Flight 191 are three crew members. Leading the experienced flight crew is Captain Edward Connors, aged 57. Connors has nearly 30,000 hours of flight experience, 6,000 of which are in command of the Lockheed L-1011, spanning a career of over 30 years. In the right seat is First Officer Rudy Price, aged 42, who is flying the aircraft on this leg of the journey. He has 6,500 hours of flight experience, 1,200 of which are at the controls of the L-1011. Completing the flight crew is Second Officer Nick Nasik, who is acting as the aircraft's flight engineer. Nasik has 6,500 hours flight experience, 4,500 of which have been in the Lockheed L-1011. Now, just after 6 p.m., the aircraft is descending steadily towards runway 17 left. The runway is currently obscured by a cloud, sitting at the threshold of the airport, from which a heavy and continuous downpour of rain is falling. First Officer Price looks at the clouds in front of them and comments, Lightning coming out of that one, right ahead of us. Next in the sequence to land on runway 17 left, five miles behind Delta Airlines 191, is American Airlines Flight 539, a McDonnell Douglas MD-80. The flight crew of American Airlines 539 watches Delta Airlines 191's progress. They hear the approach controller at Dallas-Fort Worth advise the aircraft, Delta 191 Heavy, reduce speed to 150, contact 12655. They hear the captain reply, 12655, you have a nice day, we appreciate the help. The crew of American Airlines 539 hear nothing more from the L-1011 as it changes frequency, now communicating with the tower controller at Dallas-Fort Worth. The flight crew watch as Delta Airlines 191 enters the rain shaft falling in front of runway 17 left. They steadily lose sight of the aircraft as the TriStar is lost amidst the heavy downpour until finally it disappears. You are listening to Inside the Black Box. These are the events of Delta Airlines Flight 191. On the ground at Dallas-Fort Worth, the tower controller looks north. A Learjet 25 has just touched down on runway 17 left, and the controller is managing which runway exit the aircraft will depart the runway from. The controller then spots Delta Airlines 191 for the first time. He watches as the 150-ton aircraft emerges from the driving rain sitting off the end of runway 17 left. But to the controller, 
who has witnessed thousands of landings in his career, something about the aircraft doesn't look right. Normally, you would expect the aircraft to have its nose pointed upwards as it flared before touchdown. The flare reduces the descent rate of the aircraft, so it lands with as little vertical speed as possible. But as Delta Airlines 191 approaches, it is coming down in a flat attitude, with its nose almost level. Sensing that something must be wrong, the controller calls, Delta, go around. As he says this, he sees the aircraft appear to actually land in a field to the north of the runway, then momentarily take off again. He watches in horror as the L-1011 touches down again. This time, the aircraft has landed on the edge of a major highway which runs perpendicular to the runway. The controller sees a flash of fire erupt from the left side of the L-1011 as it now careens along the ground. The aircraft is speeding towards two large water tanks which sit out with the airport's boundaries. Delta 191's left fuselage and wing slams into one of these water tanks. A sheet of flame rises up, obscuring the scene from the tower controller for a moment. Then, cartwheeling through the flames, is the tail section of the Lockheed L-1011, with its rear engine still attached. The assembly comes to rest, lying on its side. Responding to what is obviously a major incident, fire trucks from the airport's three fire stations are dispatched to the scene of the crash. Within 45 seconds, the first fire trucks begin arriving at the crash site. They find a scene of carnage, with the majority of the L-1011's wreckage in flames and the aircraft's tail section lying on its side. Incredibly, rescue workers find some passengers wandering around the crash site in shock, having been flung from the aircraft as it disintegrated around them. Even in the tail section there are survivors. Some of those whose injuries are not so severe begin unfastening themselves from their seats and clambering down the remains of the tail section, where the rest of the aircraft had once been. They help those with more serious wounds escape the wreckage of the aircraft. The rain, which Delta Airlines 191 had been flying through, has now reached the crash site itself, as well as the accompanying strong wind gusts making the firefighters' efforts to extinguish the flames more difficult. A particularly strong gust of wind blows the surviving tail section over, so that it now sits upright. As the tail rights itself, the rescuers find another survivor who has been pinned beneath it, miraculously still alive. Within ten minutes of arriving at the crash site, the firefighters have the blaze under control, Emergency medical services arrive and begin triaging the survivors, determining the priority of treatment of their wounds based on their severity. It was later estimated that had this triaging not been completed, about 50% of those who had survived the crash would have later succumbed to their wounds. On Highway 114, the road which Delta Airlines 191 had travelled over is a small, and private scene of disaster. Alongside some light posts which had been knocked over as the aircraft struck them, the flattened remains of a Toyota Celica sits on the westbound lane of the highway. The driver has been ejected from the vehicle and is lying on the highway, decapitated. Despite the catastrophic damage suffered by the aircraft, 29 people aboard the L-1011 have survived the impact. Two of those will later succumb to their wounds, leaving 27 survivors in total. In sum, 136 people aboard Delta Airlines Flight 191 and one person on the ground are dead. Even before the National Transportation Safety Board investigators arrived at the crash site, opinions began to be formed about what had brought down Delta Airlines 191. The weather was immediately singled out by eyewitnesses as a likely culprit, but how it had brought down the wide-body airliner was a mystery. 
the aircraft in front of Delta Airlines 191, a small 10-seat Learjet 25 corporate jet, had flown through the area moments earlier without any incident. The day following the accident, the NTSB began their investigations. They first looked at the wreckage of the Lockheed L-1011 in an effort to understand the impact sequence and try to identify any pre-impact structural damage to the aircraft. At the time of its introduction, in 1972, the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar was by far the most advanced commercial airliner in the world. It had been introduced by Lockheed, who was keen to expand from its military underpinnings and enter the commercial airliner sector. As was popular at the time, the aircraft was a trijet, with one engine mounted on each of the TriStar's wings and a third engine being mounted on the rear of the airliner, fed through a duct on the L-1011's tail. The TriStar was a direct competitor to the McDonnell Douglas DC-10. While both aircraft appeared externally quite similar, the L-1011 was technically much more advanced. It had more fuel-efficient engines, greater levels of safety through its redundant systems, and perhaps most impressive of all, the Autoland feature. As the name suggests, Autoland automates many of the procedures associated with landing an aircraft. It can be used in conditions of very poor visibility, where traditionally aircraft would have had to divert to an alternative airport. While the TriStar was not the first commercial airliner to have the Autoland feature, Lockheed placed enormous emphasis on it during marketing. Unfortunately, the L-1011 had a checkered history, stemming back from before it had even carried its first passenger. The introduction of the aircraft had been delayed for two years due to problems with the development of the new Rolls-Royce RB211 engines. This prompted major customers to opt for the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 instead of the TriStar. As the trijet configuration fell out of favour, to be replaced by twin-engined aircraft, the TriStar's sales suffered further. The year preceding the accident, 1984, Lockheed had stopped production of the aircraft. While the L-1011 had been involved in some significant accidents since its introduction, few of these were caused by a failure of the aircraft itself. In order to rule out mechanical failure, the investigators followed the trail of the aircraft's wreckage, back from the aircraft's final resting place beside the two water tanks. They found that the aircraft's first impact point was almost 6,500 feet before the runway threshold of 17 left. In a ploughed field, the investigators discovered an impression of the L-1011's main landing gear in the soft earth. These impressions were only about 6 inches deep and continued for approximately 250 feet before disappearing. The impressions appeared and disappeared numerous times over the next 1,500 feet. This told the investigators that the L-1011 had touched down relatively lightly at first. The landing gear tracks continued until reaching State Highway 114, a multi-lane road running in an east-west direction in front of the airport's threshold. The nose landing gear had touched down in the westbound lanes. By measuring the angle between the touchdown points of the main landing gear and the nose gear, the investigators were able to determine that the aircraft had developed a significant yaw to the left after landing. It was at this point that the L-1011's number one engine, sitting on the left of the fuselage, had made contact with the Toyota travelling in the westbound lane. This was confirmed by the discovery of fragments of the engine lodged into the car's wreckage and pieces of the automobile being found within the number one engine itself. A crater about two and a half feet deep containing various components of the number one engine which had struck the Toyota was found 750 feet south of the highway. The number one engine itself was located further south of this crater. It appeared that from then on, the L-1011 had begun to break apart.
The L-1011 had struck two lamp posts situated in the middle of the highway before continuing south, yawing further and further left. Between the final impact point at the water tanks and the state highway was a trail of various aircraft components, including the nose landing gear, the left horizontal stabiliser, engine components, and pieces of the wing trailing edge flaps and leading edge slats. The main body of the airliner, now yawing even further left, had grazed the north water tank before impacting the southern water tank. The cockpit of the aircraft and the first 12 rows of seats in the passenger cabin had been obliterated on impact. During the breakup sequence, the rear quarter of the aircraft, which included the rear engine, became separated. Since the aircraft was yawing to the left at this point, the rear was catapulted past the impact site. Rows 12 through 34 of the fuselage had been disintegrated during the accident sequence. Despite this, somehow passengers within this area had survived, even as the aircraft had broken up around them and the area had been engulfed in flames. Not only was the separation of the tail of the aircraft fortuitous for the passengers in this area, it was also lucky for the NTSB. This was because the aircraft's flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder were contained within this portion of the aircraft. These were recovered undamaged from the tail and sent for data recovery and analysis. The investigators looked at the aircraft's three engines to determine if there had been any failure that might have led to a reduction in thrust. The L-1011 was fitted exclusively with the Rolls-Royce RB211 engine. These engines had actually been designed specifically to power the Lockheed TriStar. Examination of all three engines' rotating components indicated that at the time of impact, they had all been generating power. The investigators also looked at each of the engine's thrust reversers. During landing, an aircraft needs to touch down, then lose speed in the space available to it on the runway. However, the aircraft's engines which up until now have been helping to propel the aircraft forward, are now acting against what the pilots want to do, which is slow down. Thrust reversers fix this problem by repurposing the aircraft's thrust. The RB211 uses what is known as a cold stream cascade reverser. This reverser redirects the engine's airflow by opening vents around the circumference of the engine. These vents block the flow of air generating thrust out of the back of the engine and redirect it forward. This allows the engines to actively help slow the aircraft down. The reverser type is known as a cold stream cascade because it only uses the cold air of the turbofan engine. It does not use the hot air produced by the engine's combustion. On Delta Airlines 191, the thrust reversers on the number 1 and number 2 engines had been generating full reverse thrust at the time the aircraft broke apart. The number 3 thrust reverser appeared to have been in transit from full reverse thrust to their stowed status. The investigators believed that one of the pilots might have knocked the throttle of the number 3 engine during the impact sequence. The NTSB looked at the wreckage for other signs of damage that may have come from other sources. As we mentioned earlier, the weather was considered a prime suspect for the downing of the aircraft, but the exact cause was not yet clear. Given the thunderstorm the L-1011 had been travelling through in the moments before the crash, the NTSB considered lightning as a possible culprit for the loss of Delta Airlines 191. Many of the eyewitnesses on the ground had reported lightning in the area that Delta Airlines 191 had been travelling through. Unfortunately, the disintegration of the aircraft after it struck the southern water tank limited the amount of structure available for inspection. 
Investigators examined what fragments they could, and in total looked at 33 separate structural segments, ranging from the nose landing gear strut to the tail of the aircraft. Perhaps most importantly, the investigators also looked at the static discharge wicks. The static discharge wicks on an aircraft usually sit on the rear of the aircraft's wing or horizontal stabiliser. They are designed to emit the static charge which builds up on an aircraft in a constant fashion as it travels through the atmosphere. Without the static discharge wicks, electricity would be discharged in larger quantities from other pointed areas, such as antennas or the aircraft's vertical stabiliser. If electricity were permitted to be discharged in this way, it would cause disruption to the aircraft's communication and navigation systems. It is important to remember that these static discharge wicks do not reduce the likelihood of the aircraft being struck by lightning. However, the wicks are susceptible to damage by lightning, so would tell the investigators quite clearly if a lightning strike had taken place. On inspection, the static discharge wicks are not damaged. This makes the likelihood of a lightning strike very unlikely. But if lightning had not caused the accident, what could have? Based on where the L-1011 had come down, far before runway 17 left, the investigators considered wind shear as a cause of the accident. Wind shear refers to a change in the wind's speed or direction over a very short distance. The wind shear can cause the indicated airspeed to increase or decrease. Aeroplanes experience wind shear all the time while flying through the air. Normally, wind shear is not a dangerous phenomenon. If the wind shear acts to slow the aircraft down, at altitude, the aeroplane can trade its altitude for airspeed by lowering the nose of the aircraft. The descent causes the aeroplane to lose height, but build airspeed. Alternatively, the pilot can increase the engine's thrust to build airspeed. Where wind shear does pose a particular risk is when an airliner is at low altitude and low speeds, such as when taking off and landing, and when the wind shear acts to reduce the aircraft's already limited airspeed. When the aeroplane is only a few hundred feet above the ground, there is a limited opportunity to trade altitude for airspeed by lowering the nose. In addition, the high bypass turbofans on modern commercial airliners, while very efficient, take time to spool up and generate their full level of thrust. The dangers of wind shear are very real, but in 1985 were not well understood. There had been several high-profile aviation accidents in the United States caused by wind shear in the lead-up to 1985. Eastern Airlines Flight 66 had crashed while on approach to JFK International Airport in New York with a loss of 113 lives. In addition, Pan Am Flight 759 had been brought down by a wind shear event shortly after takeoff from Miami in 1982. A significant weather event would have been required to bring down a commercial airliner due to wind shear. The investigators also had to consider that a much smaller aircraft had landed only minutes before Delta Airlines 191 had come down. The common link between the Learjet 25, which had landed successfully minutes before, and Delta Airlines 191 was that they had both flown through the single thunderstorm cell situated off the end of runway 17 left. That thunderstorm was the consequence of a much larger weather system which had been affecting the southern United States on the day of the accident. On the morning of August 2nd, 1985, weather maps revealed that a cold front extended from the east coast of the United States back into the southern plains that sit in the south of the country. As the name suggests, a cold front is the leading edge of a cooler mass of air, which is moving to replace a warmer mass of air. In our case, 
the warmer mass of air, which sat to the south of the cold front, was situated above Texas, and Dallas-Fort Worth Airport in particular. As the 2nd of August wore on, temperatures across north and central Texas climbed into the upper 90s, and even up to 101 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37 degrees Celsius, at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. This daytime heating, combined with the humid air at ground level, resulted in the development of afternoon cumulus clouds across much of north and central Texas. These clouds are formed as the warm air on the ground heats low-level moisture, which causes it to rise as a gas called water vapour. Eventually, after rising far enough from the Earth's surface, the warm and moist air cools and condenses into tiny droplets of water. These droplets stick to particles in the air, such as dust, smoke particles, and sea salt. These particles are known to meteorologists as aerosols, condensation nuclei, or cloud seeds. When enough water droplets, which are tiny, condense on the surface of a cloud seed particle, a cloud droplet is formed. When enough of these cloud droplets combine, this is how a cloud is formed. If the cloud droplets become heavier than the air they are situated in, they will fall from the sky in the form of rain. There are many types of clouds which go beyond the scope of this podcast. Often, when we think of clouds, we think of white, fluffy clouds. These are called cumulus clouds. But on the 2nd of August 1985, a different and much more dangerous cloud is forming, the cumulonimbus. The cumulonimbus cloud is the basic building block of the thunderstorm. As we discussed earlier, a cold front was advancing steadily southwards towards Texas. This cold mass of air was displacing the warm air closer to the ground, and because cold air is heavier than the warm air it was replacing, it forced the warm air upwards. This caused the air at higher altitudes in Texas to be warmer than usual. When water vapour condenses to form a water droplet, heat is released in the change of state from gas to liquid. This is called latent heat. With the right conditions on the 2nd of August, this heat was sufficient to cause some of the water already in the cloud as condensation to flash back to vapour once again. The newly created vapour rose higher into the atmosphere until it reached cooler air once again, where it itself condensed, releasing its own heat. The heat caused by this condensation causes yet more water to vaporise, and the process continues. This creates a significant updraft of air as the water vapour rises higher and higher under its own momentum. This stage of thunderstorm development is known as the cumulus stage. The chain reaction causes the cumulus clouds to build themselves up steadily. The process can continue until the clouds can be tens of thousands of feet high. In the case of a cumulonimbus cloud, the formation will build up until it reaches a point in the atmosphere known as the tropopause. The tropopause is the height above the Earth's surface where air stops cooling as height increases. To somebody observing the cloud formation, the rising vapour appears to hit an invisible ceiling, and instead of rising any higher, it begins to fan out in all directions. The cumulonimbus forms a characteristic shape that juts out over the top of the cloud, called an anvil by meteorologists. The cloud has now reached what is known as the mature stage of its development. As the water droplets combine and coalesce in the thin atmosphere, they become heavier and heavier. Eventually, they become heavy enough that these droplets begin to fall back to Earth. As a consequence of friction, 
The droplets of water drag the cold air at high altitudes down with it, leading to a downdraft of air. But at the same time, warm air is still being fed upwards by the rising water vapour from below. The downdraft of the cold air will eventually overcome the warmer updraft until the downdraft begins to dominate. The storm has now reached its final stage, the dissipation stage. The main reserve of water, which can weigh hundreds of tons, is free to fall from the cloud. The falling raindrops continue to drag cold air with them, but now in much larger quantities than before. If this downdraft of air builds sufficient momentum, it can lead to a downburst, a situation where the mass of cold air accompanying the rain extends below the base of the cloud. The mass of air is propelled towards the ground, where it flies out in all directions. Think of how water behaves when you turn on a water faucet to full power and allow it to strike the bottom of the sink. Once the jet of water strikes the sink, it fans out in all directions. The same is true of a downburst. The cold air, propelled downwards by the heavy rain, goes through three main stages. The first is the contact stage where the rush of cold air extends from below the cloud base above it and impacts the ground. Think of this stage as the time between turning the water faucet on and the water hitting the sink. The second stage is the outburst. After impacting the ground, the wind is propelled out in all directions, curling upwards as it does so. The final stage of the downburst is the cushion stage. The speed of the cold air rushing from the cloud above is slowed by the cushion of high-pressure air that has already fallen. This slows the speed of the downburst until it eventually blows itself out. These weather events can be very localised. A downburst with an area of less than two and a half miles is referred to as a microburst. Anything larger is referred to as a macroburst. Since only a single thunderstorm cell was situated off the end of runway 17 left, any downburst from this cell would definitely have been a microburst. Clearly, this jet of air would cause a significant risk of wind shear for any aircraft travelling through it. As an aircraft travels towards a microburst, it will first experience a headwind and a consequent increase in indicated airspeed as it travels through the outflow. But that initial increase will rapidly dissipate as the aircraft travels into the centre of the downburst. As the aeroplane reaches the other side of the downburst, it will experience the outburst in the opposite direction, leading to a tailwind and most dangerously to a drop in indicated airspeed. Dallas-Fort Worth Airport was fitted with a system to try and detect wind shear events such as these, known as the Low-Level Wind Shear Alert System. As the name suggests, this system is designed to detect and warn pilots and air traffic controllers of wind shear events. The apparatus consists of six 20-foot masts situated around the airport, with some being mounted near the runway and others on the periphery of the airport. If the wind speeds measured between the sensors close to the runway and those on the periphery differed by more than 15 knots, an alarm would be sounded in the Dallas-Fort Worth control tower, as well as a reading on the difference in the wind speeds. Unfortunately, this system has a number of problems. First, it is incapable of detecting winds that are situated above it. The system also cannot detect up or down drafts. Finally, if a gust of wind should approach the airport in such a way that it affects both the runway base sensors and the periphery sensors at the same time, an alert will not be triggered. In any case, the microburst which investigators were considering would have been located below the thunderstorm, about 2,000 feet beyond the northernmost sensor.
It therefore would have been out of range of the sensor and the low-level wind shear alert system. Upon inspecting Delta 191's digital flight data recorder, the unit was undamaged and in working order on arrival at the safety board's laboratory. Its tape was removed and read out. The DFDR tape contained a wealth of useful information, such as indicated airspeed, angle of attack, and performance of the engines. But perhaps most usefully for the investigators, the tape also contained information on the vertical and longitudinal acceleration forces affecting the aircraft. The Lockheed California Company, an aeronautical systems subsidiary of Lockheed, and NASA were requested by the NTSB to analyse the various DFDR parameters. They were asked to use parameters such as the vertical and longitudinal acceleration forces to try and determine the horizontal and vertical wind velocities affecting the airplane's performance during the approach to Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. In determining the wind field penetrated by Flight 191 during the approach to Dallas-Fort Worth, the airplane's inertial flight path was reconstructed based on data retrieved from the L-1011's three accelerometers. This flight path, known as the inertial flight path, was then compared with flight paths constructed from radar data retrieved from the Fort Worth radar logs. The investigators find that the aircraft had been subjected to extreme forces in all directions during the final minute of the flight. Both strong headwinds and tailwinds were recorded, as well as strong lateral gusts of wind against the aircraft. Such extreme and sudden changes in wind direction could only have been caused by a microburst. Using all of this information and in combination with the aircraft's cockpit voice recorder, the investigators are able to build a complete and definitive picture of the final minutes of Delta Airlines Flight 191. It is just after 6.04pm. Delta Airlines 191 has just been transferred to the tower controller at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. The Lockheed L-1011 is established on final approach at 1,600 feet for runway 17 left. A heavy downpour of rain obscures the runway. On the other side of the downpour, a Learjet 25 is just preparing to touch down on runway 17 left. The pilot of that aircraft does not realise how lucky he has been. Behind him, the thunderstorm situated directly off the end of runway 17 left has just entered into its third and most destructive phase, dissipation. The cloud droplets, no longer able to stay airborne, begin to make their way earthwards as rain. The hundreds of tons of water drag large volumes of air with it, creating a strong downdraft. On this occasion, the force of the weather phenomenon is enough to create a microburst which extends below the cloud base of the thunderstorm. What is essentially a high-pressure jet of cold air is now being propelled from the cloud base directly in the flight path of Delta Airlines 191. First Officer Price calls for the before-landing checklist. Second Officer Nasik begins reading through the checklist. Landing gear? Down. Three green, indicating that all of the aircraft's landing gear are successfully extended and locked. Flaps and slats? Both have been extended to 33 degrees and are showing as green, locked in place. The flight engineer confirms 14 green lights on his panel. The aircraft is configured and ready to land. First Officer Price looks out of the large windows of the L-1011 and sees lightning flashes in the cloud ahead and above them. He comments, Lightning coming out of that one. 
right ahead of us. Neither of his colleagues reply. The aircraft continues its steady descent towards the runway, which is still obscured by the heavy downpour coming from below the thunderstorm. The microburst has now reached the ground. The mass of air is propelled out in all directions. Although to the naked eye the downpour looks identical to when the Learjet had flown through it, it is now harbouring a violent and dangerous mass of air. As the L-1011 travels towards the microburst, it begins to experience a headwind as air is pushed outward from the centre of the blast towards the aircraft. This headwind causes the indicated airspeed of Delta Airlines 191 to start rising from the desired speed of 150 knots to 172 knots. As the air rolls out after impacting the ground, it also creates a 10 knot updraft, slowing the aircraft's descent. Captain Connors tells First Officer Price to watch his speed. In response, First Officer Price retards the throttles. The three RB 211s spool down to their idle flight setting. First Officer Price also pushes the nose of the aircraft down to counter the updraft they are experiencing, so the descent rate increases. Delta Airlines 191 now enters the curtain of rain directly in front of the aircraft, which lies between it and runway 17 left. The pilot's forward vision is completely obscured as rain lashes the cockpit. Captain Connors, who is still monitoring the aircraft's speed, recognises the impending risk of wind shear. Referring to the aircraft's speed, he tells First Officer Price, You're going to lose it all of a sudden. There it is. Within the space of ten seconds, the winds which have been helping the aircraft to stay airborne will almost completely reverse. The headwind, which had increased the aircraft's indicated airspeed, begins to decrease as the L-1011 travels into the heart of the downburst. The 10-knot updraft which had been acting from below now completely reverses, becoming a 20-knot downdraft, pushing the L-1011 towards the ground. To counter the downdraft, which is now forcing the aircraft towards the ground below, and maintain the correct glide slope, First Officer Price increases the aircraft's angle of attack, so the nose now points higher. But the combination of the loss of headwind and the aircraft's high nose attitude means the airliner's speed begins to fall quickly. Captain Connors, referring to the aircraft's throttles, tells First Officer Price, Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. First Officer Price throttles up the three engines to almost their takeoff go around power setting. But because their power has been reduced to almost idle, it takes some time for them to begin generating thrust again, and the aircraft's speed continues to fall. Within 10 seconds, the airspeed has fallen by 44 knots coming dangerously close to the L-1011's stall speed. But eventually, the three RB-211s do begin generating thrust, and the aircraft's speed begins to build up. In response, First Officer Price retards the aircraft's throttles to about two-thirds of the engine's full power. At this point, Delta Airlines Flight 191 is travelling through the heart of the downpour and associated downdraft. The pilot's visibility is nil, and they have already been subjected to several wind shear events. However, despite these problems, the aircraft has more or less managed to maintain its path along the glide slope towards runway 17 left. 
unfortunately, that is about to change. At 6.05 and 35 seconds, Delta Airlines 191 encounters a weather phenomenon that can best be described as severe and localised. Within one second, large variations in wind components along all three axes of the aircraft were experienced. The headwind, which had decreased previously, now completely disappears and the vertical winds reversed from a 40 feet per second downdraft to a 20 feet per second updraft. At the same time, a severe lateral gust strikes the left of the aircraft. The gust forces Delta Airlines 191 to roll hard to the right. The sudden updraft causes the aircraft's nose to be pushed violently upwards. The loss of headwind, in combination with the increased angle of attack, causes the aircraft's speed to fall once again. Captain Connors shouts, Hang on to the son of a bitch. First Officer Price needs to turn the control column almost fully left to correct the L-1011's lurch to the right. The aircraft's throttles are now pushed to their stops so that the three engines are generating their maximum thrust. The L-1011's engines should be generating more than enough thrust to maintain altitude, but once again, fate is conspiring against the pilots. Now, the TriStar flies into a 30-knot tailwind, causing indicated airspeed to plummet and the airliner's wings to generate less lift. At the same time, in response to the aircraft's nose pitching up from the updraft, First Officer Price pushes the control yoke forward in an attempt to lower the aircraft's angle of attack and build speed. However, as he does this, in a cruel twist, the updraft which had been forcing the aircraft's nose up reverses again to a downdraft, pushing the nose down. First Officer Price's nose down inputs, in combination with the strong downdraft, causes the L-1011 to nose down and begin losing altitude very quickly. Delta Airlines 191 has now departed the ILS glide slope and is much lower than it should be, with its nose pointing downwards and its descent rate building rapidly. At 6.05 and 44 seconds, the first ground proximity warning system alarm sounds in the cockpit warning the pilots of their excessive sink rate. Delta Airlines 191, at only 420 feet, is descending at a rate of 3,000 feet per minute. Captain Connors recognises the approach onto runway 17 left must be abandoned immediately. In order to execute a missed approach, he shouts TOGA. TOGA is an abbreviation for takeoff go around. One of the pilots, most likely Captain Connors, switches the flight director's mode from the approach and landing configuration to takeoff go around mode. The flight director senses the aircraft's configuration, engine thrust, and angle of attack, and displays command bars on the L1011's instruments, which tell the pilots at which angle to climb the aircraft in order to abort the takeoff. If followed, These instructions should permit the aircraft to safely go around. The flight director will maintain the aircraft's speed at a minimum of one and a quarter times the aircraft's stall speed, based on its configuration. But at 6.05 and 46 seconds, the aircraft's descent rate is 5,000 feet per minute, with the 150-ton aircraft only 280 feet above the ground. Even before the command bars appear, First Officer Price is already pulling back hard on the control column to arrest the descent. In an exact reversal of what had happened before, the downdraft which had been forcing the aircraft's nose downwards switches to a 10-knot updraft. This causes the L-1011's nose to pitch up much further than had been intended, 
but this has the effect of reducing the aircraft's descent until the L-1011 stops sinking. With about 50 feet to spare, the aircraft has stopped falling. Unfortunately, at that moment, the increase in angle of attack which First Officer Price has used to arrest the descent causes the stick shaker to be activated on his control yoke. In an action that would have been drilled into him since his training, and most likely instinctively, First Officer Price pushes the control yoke forward in order to silence the stick shaker, even though the flight director is still instructing the pilot to fly up. First Officer Price has lowered the aircraft's nose ever so slightly, which causes the airliner to start sinking again. The L-1011 falls the remaining 50 feet at a gentle descent rate of only 10 feet per second. Realising what is about to happen, First Officer Price pulls the nose up at the last minute, but it is too late. Travelling at 170 knots, and with its engines screaming at almost full power, Delta Airlines 191's main landing gear touches down in the ploughed field. One of the pilots exclaims, Oh shit! After touching down, the aircraft actually begins to accelerate. First Officer Price activates the thrust reverses on the aircraft in an attempt to lose speed. Bouncing across the ploughed field and travelling at nearly 350 feet per second, the Lockheed L-1011 takes less than 5 seconds to reach State Highway 114, almost becoming airborne again as it reaches the busy road. The L-1011 smashes through a lamppost. The left number one engine obliterates the westbound travelling Toyota, tearing the roof off and decapitating the driver in the process. It is at this point that the cockpit voice recorder stops operating. After travelling over State Highway 114 towards the airport, the L-1011 begins to break apart. Yawing far to the left after striking the car with its left engine, the number one engine breaks free. The five-and-a-half-ton Rolls-Royce RB211 tumbles along the ground, shedding parts as it travels. The fuel contained within the shattered left wing erupts into flames. The fire pierces the cabin of the aircraft where the wings meet the fuselage. Passengers shield themselves from the fiercely burning jet fuel. Some passengers unbuckle their seats to avoid the flames, only to be thrown from the aircraft as it disintegrates around them. Parts continue to fly off the aircraft as it yaws further left. The L-1011 careens another 1,500 feet before first grazing the north water tank and impacting the south water tank. Most of the front of the aircraft is destroyed instantly on impact. The yawing motion causes the rear of the aircraft to slingshot through the inferno that was the front and middle sections. The tail travels another 1,000 feet under its own momentum before coming to rest, lying on its side. Delta Airlines 191 entered the microburst at 6.05 and 14 seconds and crashed at 6.05 and 52 seconds. The entire accident sequence lasted less than a minute. The NTSB could not determine with certainty why Captain Connors chose to continue his approach into the thunderstorm in front of them, especially after First Officer Price had pointed out the lightning coming from the cloud above the downpour. Captain Connors was noted for being prudent and cautious by his colleagues, and demonstrated this cautiousness earlier in the flight, effectively demanding that the aircraft be routed around some inclement weather. The flight crew were scheduled to operate a different flight back to Orlando, Florida. Had the pilots chosen to divert to another airport, instead of landing at Dallas-Fort Worth, this would have caused significant delays to the airline.
Captain Connors had also just witnessed several other aircraft travel through the weather without incident, including the Learjet 25, an aircraft much smaller than the Lockheed L-1011. The investigators also considered it likely that the warnings issued by air traffic controllers about the presence of the thunderstorm may have played down the significance of it. In particular, about 10 minutes before the accident, one of the controllers had told all aircraft on frequency, There's a little rain shower just north of the airport. They're starting to make ILS approaches. There was no suggestion of cancelling the approach within the cockpit following the receipt of this information. While the NTSB did give some attention to the training of the pilots in responding to a wind shear event, such as the microburst experienced by Delta Airlines 191, more emphasis was placed on detecting and avoiding the wind shear altogether. In its report on the loss of Delta Airlines 191, the NTSB reiterated the recommendations it had already made to the FAA following the loss of other aircraft in similar circumstances, including Eastern Airlines Flight 66 and Pan Am Flight 759. It would be the loss of Delta Airlines 191 that would spur the FAA to action. In 1986, NASA and the FAA signed a Memorandum of Agreement establishing the NASA FAA Airborne Wind Shear Program to investigate the feasibility of remote airborne wind shear detection. The wind shear program was divided into three main elements, hazard characterization, sensor technology, and flight management systems. Hazard characterization studied the detailed characteristics and complete nature of the hazard posed by thunderstorm-induced microbursts, By building a model of the shape and size of wind shear events, as well as the effect on the aircraft, NASA and the FAA were able to consider systems that might reliably be able to detect these events. The models in the hazard characterization study had told the researchers that a system needed to give pilots at least 10 seconds of warning in order for them to take action and realize a safety benefit. Initially, These detection systems were modelled and tested against the wind shear models developed in the hazard characterization phase. Where the detection methods showed promise, they were then prepared for flight testing. In all, three main technologies were considered. The first was infrared technology. Infrared technology for detecting wind shear actually predated the NASA FAA study by about five years. Infrared technology relies on the principle that a microburst occurs when a mass of cool air aloft rapidly descends through warmer, ambient air. As a consequence of this descent, a temperature gradient is typically experienced by an airplane penetrating a microburst. It was suggested that a forward-looking infrared device could sense temperatures well ahead of an airplane and identify a thermal signature that was associated with a microburst. The system relies on the assumption that there is a correlation between the sensed thermal signature and the wind shear hazard of a microburst. While the system was sometimes able to detect wind shear events, the relationship between the temperature gradient and the presence of a wind shear event was not strong enough to suggest using infrared as a practical means of detecting wind shear. The researchers then turned to radar, and in particular, Doppler radar. Radar works by emitting radio signals which bounce off an object, then measure the reflection. Doppler radar adds another element, by measuring how the motion of the radar's target has affected the frequency of the radio signals received from that object, a phenomenon known as the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is experienced most frequently in our day-to-day lives when we hear the change in pitch of emergency services sirens, as they approach and then pass us. In the case of Doppler radar for aircraft, the radio signals would be bounced off the water molecules themselves that made up the downpour below a thunderstorm, then returned to the receiver. Using this information, 
The radar system can calculate the velocity of the winds facing the aircraft and whether a wind shear event caused by a microburst was present. Before describing the last method of wind shear detection that was considered, it is important to clarify that there are actually two types of microburst which can develop. The first, which led to the loss of Delta Airlines 191, was a wet microburst. As discussed, the downdraft of air is caused by rain droplets pulling cold air down with it, causing it to accelerate towards the ground. The second form of microburst is known as a dry microburst. In this scenario, the rain which is falling below the cloud base of a thunderstorm begins to evaporate. Just how earlier the condensation of water vapour and clouds led to a temperature increase, the evaporation of water leads to a temperature decrease as the molecules change their state. The cold, heavier air sinks towards the ground, displacing the warmer air below it. The result for aircraft travelling below this phenomenon is the same as a jet of cold air rushes towards the ground, spreading out in all directions. Dry microbursts are even more dangerous than the wet microbursts that brought down Delta Airlines 191, because unlike a wet microburst, which includes a telltale heavy rain downpour, there may be very little rain visible from below the cloud base, since the majority of it is evaporating before it can fall as rain. Radar cannot detect the movement of air itself. If it could, the technology would not be capable of detecting aircraft, because the radio waves would just be reflected off the air directly in front of the array. Instead, a different technology was proposed by the researchers, LIDAR. LIDAR works in very much the same way as Doppler radar, but emits a light signal, usually in the form of laser light, which is returned as backscatter. The LIDAR actually bounces light off the cloud seed within the air itself, so no moisture is required in order to detect wind shear. The final phase of the wind shear program was the flight management component, which involves studying appropriate recovery techniques for pilots should they encounter a wind shear event. Although the computer simulations the researchers undertook in understanding the wind shear phenomenon, studying detection methods, and recovery techniques were important, there is no substitute for real experience, and this is perhaps the most incredible part of the wind shear study. NASA fitted out a Boeing 737 into what was essentially a flying laboratory, mounting the proposed detection equipment on the front of the aircraft. Over a period of two years, the crew of the aircraft would actively seek out microbursts throughout the United States. Dry microbursts were found in the state of Colorado, and wet microbursts were found in the state of Florida. In all, the aircraft travelled through a total of 75 microbursts at altitudes of between 750 and 1,100 feet, about the same altitude as Delta Airlines 191. By putting themselves at incredible personal risk, the crew of this aircraft were able to gather an enormous amount of data on microbursts, how to detect them, and how to recover from them. Ultimately, it would be the Doppler radar technology which would win out as the technology of choice in detecting microburst events. These airborne systems, in combination with the ground-based Doppler radars situated at airports with their distinctive golf ball-shaped radomes, are commonplace. Systems such as these provide pilots with forewarning, which is by far the most important factor in surviving an encounter with a microburst. These technologies, which keep us safe today, trace their origins back to the loss of Delta Airlines Flight 191 on the 2nd of August, 1985. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of Inside the Black Box. The podcast is coming up to 30,000 downloads, which is a great milestone, and I hope the show continues to grow. As always, follow the podcast on Twitter at ITBB Podcast. That's India, Tango, Bravo, Bravo, Podcast.
I would also be grateful if you could leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. The show only grows through word of mouth, so if you know somebody who might enjoy the podcast, tell them about it. Until the next time.